then we'll begin. I had a weird situation. This has nothing to do with ceramics. I had a weird situation happen to me this morning. Um, this kid walks into my room and he, he asks me, do you have any India ink? And I said, well, no, not really. I teach ceramics. We don't really use India ink a lot. And then I asked him what he wanted to use it for. And he said he wanted to give himself a tattoo, like a stick and poke tattoo. And I just thought, okay, first of all, that's really gutsy to walk in here and ask for something to give yourself a tattoo with. And secondly, like, why, why would we do this at school? Like, this is something maybe do on your own free time. It's artistic. And I guess I have to support the artistic nature of it, but I just couldn't believe that somebody was gonna give themselves a tattoo at school. Do kids do this? Is this a common thing? Yeah, they can put a little shop in the bathroom and everything. Really? No. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's where all our Indian ink is going. Um, anyway, I just thought that was really interesting that, that first of all, he was he was old enough to ask for it and then honest enough to tell me why he needed it. Um, anyway, I was, I was like, pause. Has nothing to do with what we're doing today. Um, today, we are going to move on to the next step in our porcelain project. Uh, but first, we are going to kind of take a step back and, and uh, talk a little bit about uh, some history of ceramics. I think that's an important thing in an advanced class like this is for you to learn a little bit about the people who have shaped the face of ceramics and um, are, are really important names to know in the ceramics world. So today we're going to learn about Toshiko Takaezu, uh, a Japanese-American artist who um, was revolutionary in the world of ceramics. So that's why you have your notebook out in front of you. I'm going to have you jotting down a few things about her um, as we go along. <laughs> All right, so that's the first thing we're going to do, learn about uh, Toshiko Takaizu uh, and her closed vessels, because that's what we're doing for this project. We're making a uh, closed vessel. Uh, I am going to go over the goals that we have for this unit, why we're doing what we're doing, and what our end goal is kind of going to be. Uh, and then we're actually going to move on to the next step of taking your two porcelain bowls and using the porcelain slip that you made yesterday, and then scoring and slipping those together to begin actually making enclosed form. So this is where all the nuts and bolts and things that we've been doing are going to start to come together to actually look like something. So that's kind of exciting. <laughs> um, I do want to point out um, that today's shape is going to be an enclosed form, which means totally sealed off. Um, eventually, we're going to be making a closed form. <laughs> Starting with the letters A and C, <laughs> last name starting with A and B, please report to the media center for picture retake. Is that anybody in here? Oh, this is on upside down. Whew, I'm pretty sure I just swallowed a football from my other mouth. That doesn't go well. Um, all right, so just wanted to point out the difference between, between enclosed which is what we'll be making today, where it's totally sealed off <coughs> and closed. <coughs> oh my gosh. <coughs> I have to drink some water. Woo. The hazards of wearing masks. All right. I'm going to pause my talking for a little bit. I want you to look at the screen. Um, these are two vessels by Toshiko Takaezu. I'm gonna talk more about her in a second, but first, I just want you to look at these two pieces. And on that notebook in front of you, I want you to jot down your impressions of the, the work. What, when you look at this, what does it make you feel? What do you literally see? Um, what you hypothesize about what these are? So I'm gonna give you two minutes to jot down maybe five to 10 words about what you see, what your impressions of this work are, and then I'm gonna ask you to share it. People at home, you are doing the same. Look at these works of art, write down your impressions, five to 10 words about these two pieces. I'm going to drink some tea. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
People at home, I just have to ask, is what you see on the screen right now the two pots with the white background, or is what you see a mostly black screen with a little orange slide on it? No, we see the two pots. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Okay, so I would like to ask for your impressions, like for you to just call out a word or a phrase that you think of, or these pots made you write down on your notebook. What's one thing you wrote down? Colorful. Colorful, okay, what's another one? Smooth. Smooth, great, what's another one? Sit. Sorry, say it like a little bit louder. Neat, okay, like neat, like neatly done. Yep, okay, great. What's another one you wrote down? Good shape. Good shape, yep. What's another one you wrote down? Let's have three more responses. People at home, you can pipe in too. Stuff, stuff you wrote down. Sylvia, what's something that you respond to? Interesting. Interesting, okay. Gavin, what's the thing that you wrote down? I don't think they look very useful. You don't think they look very useful? No. They're yeah. Hopefully too small. Very, very small. Yeah, exactly. Just big enough so that they won't blow up, but just small enough so you can't really use them for anything. Yeah, that's a good point. They look non-functional. Uh, one more response but that somebody wrote about the work. Maddie or Madeline, what's something you wrote? A monkey on it? Yeah. Oh, that's cute. Oh, yeah, I can see the silhouette of it. It, it even seems as like a little eyeball. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh, what a great observation. I never even would have seen that. Excellent. So um, I wanted you to spend a little bit of quiet time looking at these pots because these are quiet pots. These are not flashy. These are not uh, loud and ostentatious and saying, hey, look at me, look at my bright red areas and my bright blue areas uh, and my big handle sticking out. There's nothing ostentatious or showy about um, Toshiko Takayuzu's work. It's very subdued, it's very subtle, but despite that subtlety, it has a power. It has a presence to it. And so you're gonna learn a little bit more about her work and her process. Um, here, I'm gonna show you some more examples of her work. Um, this is Toshiko here throwing on the wheel. Her pieces were thrown. Some of them were coil build, like really massive pieces that would have been very hard to throw on the wheel. She would coil build. Um, sometimes she used a press mold technique that you guys are, are, are doing, but she did them much, much, much bigger. Um, uh, but all of her forms were enclosed. That was kind of a signature of her work. A student with the last name beginning with the letters C, D, and E, meaning picture retakes. Please report to the G Center at this time. Okay. So um, Toshiko Takaezu was born in Hawaii and uh, to uh, Japanese immigrants. And um, she ended up uh, kind of traveling and living in a lot of places around the United States. But she ended up in New Jersey as a professor, the ceramics professor at Princeton University. That's kind of where she ended up, and that's where. Um, she's, she's not alive anymore, but that's where she kind of ended uh, her life. Um, but she actually had a large presence. For a while, she taught in, um, in Wisconsin. So she had a large presence in Wisconsin, not too far from us. Um, and so uh, we're going to look at more examples of her work now. You can see um, these are, are very much in line with what we might be doing for our forms anyway, uh, for this, this project, when we're putting our two bowls together to create something that has just a, a lovely volume, that, that space that it takes up, that's its volume, it's three-dimensional space. And despite the fact that these aren't functional, as Gavin pointed out, um, they're almost, um, well, what would be the opposite of something that's, that's uh, functional? Um, what would be a work of art that is a non-functional work of art? Anyone know who 
would probably call that if it's three dimensional. It would be a sculpture, exactly. Yeah. So her pieces, despite the fact that they are vessels, like, you know, and we're used to pottery being um, vessels that you can eat or drink out of or put food in, um, her vessels are sculptural. They're not meant to hold flowers, they're not meant to, um, you know, pour your iced tea out of. Uh, they're purely meant to exist and be this quiet but strong form that, that's meant to kind of inspire you or maybe remind you of something from nature. And the glazes, does it look like she did a lot of really careful glazing or does it look like she left a lot of her glazing up to chance? Yeah, it seems to be a little bit more up to chance. It seems a little bit more random. Uh, maybe she splashed some glaze on here. Maybe she dunked her pot into glaze there. And uh, the glazing effects are, uh, are very much um, natural as well, very much subtle and unpredictable. And she probably, because of this unpredictable nature, I know that she had a lot of pots that didn't work out. Uh, she had a lot of pots that didn't turn out this nice. And she, in fact, uh, I watched a video of her where she uh, she crushed or like smashed all these pots that there were that were bad pots in her opinion, and that became the foundation of her studio. Like she crushed it down into the ground, and that became the substrate that she built her studio upon. So when you're when you're working in this unpredictable kind of quirky kind of chance based way, a lot of stuff doesn't work out all the time. But the things that work out are sublime. These pieces, I feel like you could hold one in your hand. And who said it was that smooth was the word that they pointed out? Yeah. So they, they feel like they would be the most silky, smooth, and pleasant things to touch. Um, I've never had the pleasure of being able to hold one of her works because now they're all in museums and you can't touch them. Um, but I would imagine that if I were to hold it, it would just be a really interesting tactile experience to come into contact with that. I feel like I want to like pet it like a cat. Um, so the, the, the surfaces, the glazes, I feel like I could spend a year just looking at those glazes and find something new every time I look at them. Um, and the, the forms, um, despite the fact that they're mainly red, if you look really closely at them, you can see her little finger marks from when she threw it on the wheel, the little um, rings that happen when you put your fingers into the clay and raise your walls. Those are still there. Those are still apparent. These are not any factory-made pots. These are not something you could go buy at Ikea or Target. These are pieces that were made on a human have the mark of a human, they have the imperfections of a human, they have the random chance of a human, and they have the quiet brilliance of this masterful artist, um, Toshiko. So um, here's a uh, one of Toshiko's pieces. And I want you to, uh, again, in your notebook, uh, I want you to write down about this piece in particular. I just picked this one at random. What do you think makes this a great work of art? So jot down just a couple ideas, a couple things why you think this is particularly uh, cons uh, considered to be a, a good piece. What make what is good about it, in your opinion? I'm going to give you a minute. People at home, you're doing this too. Take a look at this piece on the right. What are some things that you think make this a great work of art? Even if you're not so much in love with it, you don't think it's so great. But if you were an art critic and you're talking about its good qualities, what would be some things that might be good? So what's one thing that you think um, makes this a successful work of art? There's no wrong answers. It's just your opinion. Based on what you know already about ceramics, having been in three different classes now of ceramics, what do you think makes this successful? Yeah. The uh, like consistency and evenness of the walls go all the way up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's a pretty 
it's a curved line, but it's a pretty like strong, unbroken, straight, and then slightly curved line. Yeah, very good profile is what we would call that. The profile of the pot is very strong. Yeah, what's another thing that you think makes for um, a good work of art in this particular piece? Yeah, absolutely, it's skillfully made. Um, this is thrown on a wheel. Um, can we see the lines? Yeah, we can kind of see the lines where she, she raised the walls. And to bring your clay up and then to close it off at the top is not easy to do. Because as you remember from ceramics A and maybe ceramics B, your clay keeps wanting to get wider on the wheel. Centrifugal force wants to bring your walls outward. So to keep those walls tucked in to the point where you can close them off at the top does take a lot of skill, absolutely. What's another thing that makes this a great work of art in your opinion? I'm gonna start calling on you people. It's uh, really easy to look at. Like you can, it's not too like bold or anything. Mm -hmm. And it would just look good anyway. Absolutely, yeah. It's not anything that's gonna hurt your eyes if you look at it for too long. Uh, Cause it's got so much, it's got a lot of subtlety to it. So you could actually view it for a long period of time, but it's not gonna assault your eyeballs with any sort of bright colors or strong patterns. That's a good, really good observation. Let's have a couple more observations about why this might be considered to be a, a particularly strong piece of pottery. I feel like there's like multiple layers of cool reasons. Yeah, tell me more about that. It's like, I see like dark green the bottom and green. Oh, like there's red in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, I agree there. Are, especially in the middle, where it kind of looks like the glaze has like dripped just a little bit, it looks like the edge of the cloud. Um, the glazes have maybe mixed a little bit to create even more unpredictability and chance in the, the glazing. Yeah, and, and what's kind of interesting along with that, see how there's like a really straight line in the, like where the red glaze ends? And then whatever that whitey bit below it um, is, it kind of has more of an organic curved edge. So there's a really interesting contrast there between the straight line where the glaze maybe was dipped to and then the, the swooped line where maybe the glaze ran to. Interesting contrast there with the glaze. Um, let's have one more observation about what makes this piece uh, strong in your opinion. Uh, the white line that goes through the corner of the crack kind of makes it look like the green was supposed to be like an outer shell and it's so fast. Yeah, absolutely. It looks like the top bit is kind of like bursting out of the bottom bit, like there was a separation there almost two pots, like, like an egg and crack. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation. Very good. Um, I would like to add a couple things to your observations. Maybe you saw these two and you just didn't, um, didn't think about commenting on it. Um, but if you look at the bottom, see how the bottom comes in? Anyone remember what that's called when the pot comes in down at the bottom? Say it again. It concaves, right? It comes inward. Um, but uh, anyone remember, like when we were throwing on the wheel, we would take the wood knife and we would do uh, at the bottom of the pot to make it come in at the bottom. Do you remember what that's called, Bree? Like carving it. Carving it, and you would do an undercut. That would be the name of it. It's cut under the pot. Um, what does that undercut do for the form? How does it help the form? It's it's rid of the weight. It gets rid of the visual weight. Yep. And can you add to that, Dave? It like lifts it up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It makes it, it like literally makes it a little bit taller, but it, it makes it um, visually look lighter and look taller as well. So this is like kind of a, a, a key form, like it's kind of wide. So the fact that there's that undercut under there lifts it and makes it look like it's breathing and just lifting up off the table in a breath of air. Um, so I think that's a really important but subtle thing that makes this an effective work of art. And the other thing that I love is that little nub that's at the top. It just gives us a little focal point up there. As our eyes look at this, um, this is how my eyes travel anyway. My eyes kind of start at the dark part down at the bottom, the glaze, the dark glaze, and then my eyes kind of travel up the form and then they just kind of leap away when I get to that little nub on the top. It just gives you this little bit of, it's almost like texture, this little cherry at the top of the ice cream sundae that, um, that just kind of caps it all off and gives it this interesting little, um, sharpness in the midst of all this round. So um, those are some of the things that that, uh, that I think are, are really important about this piece. And the other thing that's important to know is context. When this was made, 
she was, um, she really rose to prominence in the 50s, the 60s, 70s, and the 80s. So she had a really long career of being a very accomplished ceramic artist. And when she was making these pots, nobody else was making pots like this. People were making, people like Warren McKenzie, who you'll learn more about on Friday, she was making really nice earthy mugs to drink out of and really nice Japanese influenced teapots uh, that you could serve your tea. And then there was a guy named Peter Volkis who was making these slashed, beat up, kicked uh, pots that were really enormous and really like the living embodiment of masculine pots. And so uh, Toshiko was making pots that were really soft and really airy and breathy and light, uh, despite the fact that some of them were quite big. And so this was really unique. What she was doing was really revolutionary. Now, I want to show you this collection of her work. These are pieces, the circular pieces in front are called moon pots. And then the taller pieces in back are part of, part of her star series of pots. So the moon pots here uh, were influenced by the moon. She would glaze them in such a way that it represented the phases of the moon. So all black pots would represent the, um, is it called the new moon when there's no moon out there? Can't remember what the name of it is. And then the full moon, of course, would be all white. And then in between, she would have these pots that were half glazed black and half glazed white to represent these, these different phases of, of the moon. Um, the taller pieces in the back are based on constellations and stars. And they would be arranged in such a way so that they were spaced like the stars in the sky. And if you look at how these pieces are displayed, like, like if you think about being in a museum and you've been in a museum and maybe you've seen ceramic pieces in a museum, um, where are ceramic pieces usually displayed in a museum? On shelves, right? Or on little plinths, those little pedestals. Um, so because most of the time ceramic pieces are quite small, right? Um, like human sized. Look at how these are displayed. These are, like Dave said, sculptures. These are pieces that have presence to them. They're big. They don't belong on any little dainty shelf. They're big enough where they can sit on the floor and we as humans can, and can interact and walk around them and really experience them in a much, much different way than if they were sitting on a shelf. So they have this strong identity, this strong presence, despite still being these really soft and subtle forms. So here is her entire moon jar series. These are all the, the moon pots that she made. And these were made using a press mold technique, the same way that you guys are making this project. She just had a much bigger bowl that she used to press her clay into. Um, so she made all these, these moon jars, these moon pots, and they were meant to stay together. She was offered, she had a show of these pieces in Racine, Wisconsin, and um, somebody offered to buy one. And she said, no, you can't buy one. They're meant to go together. They're part of a, a collection, part of a, an arrangement, an assemblage. And so she ended up giving them to this museum so it could be a permanent exhibition at their museum in Racine, Wisconsin, uh, which is amazing. That's like, I don't know how much you would have sold one of these for, but I'm sure it would have been thousands of dollars. So to, to have donated all of that to the museum was pretty impressive stuff. Um, and as she was making these things, um, a few of her moon pots, she was trying to dry them in a way so they wouldn't get flattened on one side. So she decided to put, the, put one in her hammock and dry it out in her hammock so it wouldn't get a flat dent on it. And she realized that she actually really liked the parabola that the, uh, the moon jar in the hammock made. So then she made more moon jars and specifically displayed them in hammocks, which is an, a brilliant way to show off the work and to show... Um, its presence in the weight of it, weighing down the hammock and creating that beautiful arc, that beautiful curve, um, but also the lightness of them. These are pots that uh, a little bit of string in, in the hammock can support and keep uh, weightless up off the floor. Um, so really uh, just an interesting way to think about ceramics, a way that, that no one had ever thought about before. So I'm gonna show a really, really quick two minute little clip video so you can see a few more examples of her work and hear about her work. And then we'll be moving on. So the nose without change. She's a she was a teacher for decades and was prominent on the service scene for over fifty years. Hey, 
many students with the last names beginning with the letters I, J, and K, meaning picture retake for those who have not gotten their pictures taken, please report to the media center at this time. Loss. That was an obvious beauty. To Shigo, was able to balance her life in a way that was different than what she was Life is complicated, especially like this. And she was able to balance all of the different needs of making work and arranging the house for us to do. You can put it on the house, it was a very niche for the wide and then just love it. So there's a there's a long side. Sneaky quality is a um, hear the noise that makes. So we put that the animation forms or the contacts this nature of the question how important the play is possible. It could be any one of those reasons, but I think it it, it is and again that most people it's in the goals leave the show and not more inspired. I think she designed that bell. She was also a painter and a textile artist too. So that one piece that I said, you know, do you hear that sound? This was something that she did in her work and it's something you could do for this project as well. She would, uh, before she put the two halves of her pot together or if it was on a wheel, before she closed it off and made the, the top part be closed on her pot, she would take a t an extra little tiny piece of clay, wrap it in a piece of tissue so it would be protected and wouldn't stick on the inside. And she would drop that little piece of clay inside the pot and the tissue would keep it from sticking to the wet clay inside it. And then after it's fired, the tissue, of course, would burn away and that little um, ball of clay would be stuck inside the pot and it would act like this little bell or this little rattle that whenever you picked up the piece, not only could your eyes take something in, but your ears could take something in as well. So it became an auditory as well as a visual experience. Uh, which is kind of a, an interesting way to think about the work. You're thinking about how the artist, or the viewer is going to hear it and see it. Um, so last thing I want to leave you with is a quote by Toshiko. Um, she says, you are not an artist simply because you paint or sculpt or make pots that cannot be used. Uh, an artist is a poet in his or her medium. And when an artist produces a good piece, that work has mystery and unsaid quality. It is alive. That is the best possible way to explain her work. Um, I loved the quote from the video too, that like a lot of people say, I love her work, but I don't know why. Um, and it's that air of mystery about it. What is it? What is it for? Why does it have this presence that draws me in? Um, her work is just, it's very quiet. And it's the kind of work that you could spend a lot of time with, like a good friend and get to know a little bit more each day about that work. Um, and that's the ultimate goal is to, to produce something that has that mystery and that alive quality, that breathy, um, full of life kind of quality. And so that's a, a hard thing to attain, but it's something to be aware of. And uh, it's something that we're going to strive for in this piece that we're working on. So our, our goals for this project, this is kind of like giving you a heads up of the big picture here, because we've just been doing bits and pieces at this point. Um, so these are the goals for this project. To learn about the qualities of porcelain, which you've already been learning about porcelain. To effectively use a push mold to make a two-part enclosed form, which you've been doing already. You've made two push mold forms so far. Uh, to create a smooth flow between the two parts, no seam being obvious. You're scraping and shaping and smoothing. That's what you're going to do today. To attempt to capture the organic, breathy life of Toshiko Takahizu's work. 
uh, to add additional features as necessary, because maybe you want this to be a, a vase that has a whole neck. Maybe you want this to be um, a, a pour, pouring pot that could, you could use to water your flowers, or that you could use to serve. Well, you wouldn't be able to put lemonade in there. It's not going to be too big. Um, but uh, something that you could use in some capacity. Uh, so you will have a chance to add other features tomorrow. Uh, and of course, you are going to have to put a hole in it somewhere so it won't blow up. We're going to then, uh, this is new, you haven't heard about this yet, we're going to burnish this piece. So once you've completed the whole thing, we're going to take a shiny rock, a very sophisticated clay tool, this shiny rock, and we're going to burnish. We're going to polish the clay and the porcelain. You'll find that if it's in the right stage, the dry leather hard stage with this shiny rock polishing against the clay, the clay will get shiny as though it is, has been glazed. So we're going to shine it up as much as possible before firing it. And so when we end up coarse hair firing it, see how this has a shine to it? See how that like in the light, there's a reflection there? That's from burnishing. There's no glaze on this. There's no like clear spray paint on this. That's strictly from uh, the polishing that was done before it was fired. And when we coarse hair fire and make all these complete black marks on the work, um, it'll already have a really nice finish for those marks to show up on. Uh, and then of course it is optional for you to visit fire this piece and participate in the horse hair firing, but I would hope that most people would want to take part in that and fire this piece, uh, but that is optional. You'll learn about the horse hair, you'll, you'll probably be part of it in some way, even if you don't fire your work, um, but that's kind of a, a, this is your one opportunity to do something like this, so I would hope that most people would want to fire their work. Okay, so um, these are your steps for today. Any students with the last name beginning with the letters L, M, and N needing picture retake or those who have not gotten their picture taken, please report to the media center at this time. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to grab your slip container and the towel that you've taken from your table. People who are at home, I had asked you to get an old towel as well, um, just to have on hand, and today is the first day where you're gonna need it on hand. And the reason I want you to, to have that towel with your slit is I want you to shake it up pretty violently, like really, really mix it up. And so if your lid has a leak at all, um, the towel will keep the clay from going all over you. So you're gonna give it a strong shake. Yeah, mine's leaking right now, so definitely want the towel wrapped around you. Um, next, you're going to take the two clay bowls that you've made, the, um, the one that you made on Friday and then the one that you made yesterday. Uh, we want to check and see if they're leather hard. If the new one, I would assume maybe is not leather hard, maybe it's still plastic. Uh, we would want to do what it takes to get them to that plastic stage, air dry it for 20 seconds at a time because we don't want to over dry it. So 20 seconds and then test it. And then if it's not there yet, another 20 seconds and then test it. And remember, what should leather hard clay feel like? What kind of cheese? Cheddar, cheddar cheese, right? Because cheddar cheese is kind of a more firm cheese. Uh, so that you want that cheddar feeling. Um, then we finally get to start scoring and slipping. So uh, we're going to use a fork and we're going to heavily rough up both rims of both pots. See, porcelain particles are really, 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 really fine. They're really, really tiny, smaller than, than stoneware particles. So we need to create some really deep scoring marks so that all these tiny little platelets are really going to bond onto each other and stick really well because the horsehair firing process is a really violent process. We're heating our pots up to around 1800 degrees, taking tongs and lifting them out and they're going to crash cool. They're going to cool really, really quick to whatever the air temperature is out there. And if you haven't joined your pieces well, a crack is going to form where that, that seam was. So you have to score and slip this like you've never scored and slipped anything in your life, like super, super well. Um, once you've scored and slipped, uh, you're going to uh, put wrap a coil of additional porcelain around that, por that part. You're going to roll a coil, wrap it around, and then meld it back and forth. And uh, you can use your finger to meld. You can use a big popsicle stick. You can use the other end of your fork, the non-business end of your fork, to meld it all together. So you have a really, 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 really strong connection. The second thing you're going to do, people at home, and ask you to find an old ID card or plastic gift card. People who are here, you're gonna have access to steel scrapers for this next step. So you're gonna do a ton of scraping and shaping. You're gonna put a little curve in that, that metal scraper plastic card, and you're gonna use it to scrape vertically, horizontally, uh, 
uh, diagonally, just really working on probably what is going to be kind of a, a, a ridge around where you put that foil on there. We're going to work to really compress and strengthen and scrape so that ridge is really um, integrated into the clay and it's not ridge anymore. We want this nice, smooth profile, as Gavin pointed out about Toshiko's work, we want a nice profile to our pot. So we're going to spend a lot of time scraping and shaping. Um, now, this is where you're also going to use your towel because it's probable once we pop both uh, pots out of your bowl, there might be a weak spot. So we want to be a little bit careful about that. If it seems like there's a spot that wants to cave in, maybe just dry that spot for like 10 seconds. See if you can strengthen it up. Also, if you lay it on its side, as you're doing the scraping and shaping on your towel, don't let it roll off the top, um, that way you're not going to be flattening any side of it. You're going to be cushioning it, kind of like the hammocks cushioned Toshiko's work. Um, so this is going to allow you, if you don't want to keep it, keep it in your hand, you can keep it on the cloth. That way it'll, it'll cushion it and keep it um, from denting or flattening. Um, so this is going to require a lot of care. You're going to have to be really gentle with it. Um, you're going to have to go slowly with it. Don't rush it. Um, really listen to the clay. If the clay seems like it's kind of dry, do what it takes to rehydrate it. If the clay seems really uh, wet, then uh, do what it takes to dry it out. And then your uh, final thing for today is to take a photo of the, the vessel, the enclosed vessels, because for now it's going to be enclosed. It's going to be sealed off. We'll cut a hole in it tomorrow. And uh, that enclosed vessel is going to be a photograph next to the notebook page where you wrote about Toshiko Takaezu. Okay, so I want to see the, your notes, your writing, as well as your clay work for today. And then, when it's all said and done, you've, you've done your photograph for today, you're going to double bag this thing. Put it in two plastic bags so there's no possibility of it drying out. Um, double bag it and then put it back in its little uh, towel nest. So it's not going to flatten out, it's not going to roll around. Um, you could even, if you wanted to, Put it back inside your plastic bowl so it could sit in there instead of on your towel. Um, with a black name beginning with the letter O, P, or Q, the picture retake. And those who have not gotten their pictures taken, please report to the meeting center at this time. Um, but if you do put it back inside the, the bowl to let it sit there overnight, remember to put the plastic bag as a barrier between it, because otherwise it could get stuck in the, the plastic bowl and then you're kind of up a creek if it gets stuck inside there. So remember the plastic barrier. Um, so I'm actually going to do as much of these steps as I can um, right now. And what do I need to do with buck? I need to unplug this and this. I'm going to bring this over here. And then I'm going to try and work quickly, guys, because I know you want to be able to get to it. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to pin. OK, I just want everybody to really be clear what's happening. So this feels like, to me, if I try and lift it out, see, it's still moving a lot. This is the one I made yesterday. And I was a little bit nervous or like thinking that that might happen so it probably will happen to you too you might find that yesterday's bowl is a little too soft to take out so you could hair dry it but another thing you could do is you could leave it in there for now and i can still attach this to this even while it's inside the plastic bowl so that's okay to to um uh, leave it in there for a little bit longer so i'm going to take my fork this is my slip that i made it's all nice and shook up now I am going to very, very heavily score the rim of both pots. I probably should have trimmed this a little bit. I see that some areas are a little higher and some areas are a little bit lower. Um, but I might have to end up filling in some of those gaps with a little additional porcelain. By the way, kids who are at home, if you need more porcelain, um, I'm going to touch base with you in a moment here. And I want you to tell me if you need more porcelain. And I'll make sure that you get it today. One way or the other, we'll figure out a way to do it. Because you might still need porcelain for that rope. You're going to wrap around it. And then also, you might need it to be able to make a little spout or a handle. Okay, so I just slipped one of my pots. Now I'm going to slip the other one. 
So really trying to create a incredibly strong Velcro-like connection, okay? Then I'm gonna put my two pieces together. And when I put them together, because one is still in the plastic pot, I don't have the ability to meld or wrap that extra coil around it. So I am very carefully gonna pop it out. Oh, you know what I forgot? I was gonna do the rattle thing. Um, so I won't do it now because it's together already, but I'll show you how I would have done it. <laughs> so you can take as many of these as you want. Just make a little bead of clay, wrap it up in a little bit of paper towel. So it's like a little present. And before you put the two together, just throw one or two or three inside there if you want this to rattle and have it be a, an auditory experience. So here's the form, those of you in back, here's what my form looks like. It's a, kind of like an egg that's wider or that's flat at the top and the bottom, which is totally fine. Each of us are gonna have a little bit of a different form, which can still be altered, all right? So just because it is what it is right now, we can still change it if we want. So there's my coil of clay that's being wrapped around. It's just about the size of a pencil, I guess, maybe the thickness of a pencil. I'm being really cautious as I'm setting it down because it's a little bit soft yet. Okay, and then I'm gonna use the back side of my fork to do my blending. So I'm blending it up. Actually, I'm gonna use my fingers. My fingers have a little bit more sensitivity than the fork because you can't push too hard. This is hollow inside. And so we don't want to end up denting it or pushing a hole in it. So it's really more scraping. It's kind of like what you did with the pinch pot project. When you put your two pinch pots together, you did this exact same process. It's just that these are gonna be a lot thinner than your pinch pots. So therefore, you have to be a little bit more cautious with them. So once I've finished melding all the way around, I might wanna hair dry this a little bit just to really make sure it's firmed up, especially since I know that one of the pots is still a little bit on the soft side. Then I would start scraping and shaping with my steel scraper. I'm gonna try and I'm gonna set it down to do this. I'm gonna gently hang onto it, spin it, and do my scraping horizontally, vertically, until that extra coil that I added is really integrated into the form and I can't see that it's there anymore. So this is the side that I scraped a little bit more, but it's gonna take a lot more time. Um, so those, that's your process for today. Um, don't worry about poking any holes today. Don't worry about adding any other features today. We'll do that tomorrow. People who are in person, any questions? Okay, go ahead, um, pull out your pots, shake up your slip, check and see which stage your second pot is in. People at home, stay on the line. I wanna talk to you guys. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll wrap you back up. And unplug this. When Chris comes back. All right. I'm going to stop recording.